You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. There are uh, 11 games to 23 to get 500, I guess, or whatever. I know they lost 23 games, but if you can win 11, it'll be 23-23. Plus, you'd be in first place. Not only seven games out, but I look at it like this. You got to get your wins higher than your losses. And we're doing that, aren't we? We're right now trying to reason with ourselves, like if they do this and if they beat this team and if they have a good month, then they can climb back into this thing. And then we've got a baseball season with hope and the possibility of the postseason. And who knows if we get in there and a puncher's chance, you get yourself way out there. You get yourself thinking to yourself, they're going to play the the Royals and they're going to take three out of four. And you watch them take a 3-1 lead and blow it. You watch Gavin Sheets hit a towering shot, tie the thing up, and then Dylan Cease go out and load the bases, Aaron Bummer go out and clear the bases a few times with some really bad pitching, and eventually they give up eight runs in that inning on Monday night. And you sit there and you think to yourself, wait a minute, this this can't be how they're going to play when they play teams like the Royals if they're going to climb back into this thing. Like, you need to take three out of four against a team like the Royals. You got to win series. Splits do not matter anymore. Four game series, you got to take three, especially when it's against a team like the Royals, if you're ever going to get back into this thing. And and that's why, even though I've enjoyed the last week, I see Monday's game and I just go, oh, I don't know. I don't know if they've got it in them. I hope they have it in them. I want them to have it in them. I look at the schedule and I think to myself, this is doable. If you could just consistently go out and play good baseball, I don't expect you to win every game. But I expected three out of four from the Royals. And then they come back to Chicago, and they should be able to beat the Astros two out of three. They played them well at the beginning of the season. You're in your, you're in your home ballpark. If you want to get back into it, play well. You get the Royals again the weekend after that, and before that, you get the Guardians. And you get the Guardians after the Royals. You go Guardians, Royals, Guardians, into Tigers. Like You get Central Division teams none of which who have done anything that impressive. If you really are a team that just got off to a bad start, but the talent is still there, then these are the games you got to start winning. You need to have a very positive May. I mean, I'm not crazy. I'm not expecting you to be at 500 when we get to Memorial Day. But you can't just have one week where you, what did you do over the the last week? You won four out of six. You, You can't just do that and then go to 500 baseball for the next couple of weeks. You can't let a team like the Royals do what they did to you on Monday night. You you have to win far more than you lose the rest of the way just to be competitive because of the hole you put yourself into. So, you know, I'm looking at baseball right now, honest to goodness, day by day. I am looking at White Sox baseball day by day. Absolutely true story. My father asked me the other day, what do you want for your birthday? And I told him I wanted to go to a ball game with him. And he was like, we do that all the time. I'm like, let's do something that we haven't done before. He like, they like to buy me something nice all the time. My parents and my wife and everything. I'm like, get everybody together and let's just get some scout seats for me and you, dad. Like, let's sit with the rich people behind home plate because I've never sat there before. Or let's get that box that's directly behind home plate. I mean, I don't, I'm not really going to be watching the game as much as I just want to go and check it out and see what it's like with the, the all you can eat thing at the beginning and at the end you know, and sit in those cushioned seats and just see what it's like, right? I mean, prices are probably lower now for those games than they ever have been. You could probably get them in the secondary market for a steal the way that they're playing. I'm just going to hang with you, you know? I'm just hanging with dad. Win or lose. Like, if they're winning, we'll enjoy it. If they lose, we'll laugh at them because we've earned that right as fans, right? We've earned that right. They go out and do something stupid, we get to laugh about it. We get to go look at this guy. You know, when Aaron Bummer comes into the game, my father can call him a bummer and giggle about it because he thinks it's funny. Bummer the bummer. And he really is a bummer. Man, he's he should be optioned right now. He was a guy that a lot of people, when we put out that survey a couple of weeks ago, 
on SocksInTheBasement.com. And the survey's not, it, the survey's actually still there. I'm going to update it here in about a week with some new questions because the season always evolves. And I want to give people a chance to change their mind a little bit because some players may have grown on you and some players may have withered and died in the last couple of weeks. This is a fluid season, a fluid situation. Like, I've seen enough out of Joe Kelly over the last couple of times he's been out there to say, hey, maybe finally we're going to get what we expected from him. Just in time for them to, like, trade him at the trade deadline. But maybe finally we're going to get what we expected from Joe Kelly. Aaron Bummer, though. Oh, man, it's ugly. Before I get into the ugliness, remember that we're brought to you by Cork and Carey at the park. Shadow of the ballpark, 33rd in Princeton. The official home of the podcast for fans by fans, Socks in the Basement. Uh, they got an award-winning menu of burgers and ballpark favorites, two-for-one burgers when you dine in on Mondays, non sacks home games, extensive bar with a rotation of craft beers, familiar favorites, spirits, and wines. They are your home base for pregame. Bring the family over. Get the kids over there. You know, feed them. Don't be running around the ballpark trying to find that special section with that one food item that you read about online and then just find out they're gone by the third inning. And go sit down at Cork and Carry at the park. You know the food's there. You know the food's good. Come by afterwards. Celebrate the improbable win or talk about what the heck's going on with the team that night and hang out with some Sox fans. Once again, Shadow of the Ballpark, 33rd in Princeton, CorkandCarry.com. I think it's time to admit that you got an awful lot out of Aaron Bummer over his career. It just didn't line up with when the White Sox needed him most. I mean, maybe it did a little bit. He was effective in 2021. And he was pretty good in 2020 when they had that silly run in the 60-game season that would have never have ended up being a postseason run if it weren't a 60-game season and half the league was automatically in the playoffs. Because remember, they backed into that. I don't even count that year. Like, I know they made the playoffs that year, but like, That's just like one of those things like when the White Sox tell you all the former Hall of Famers that have been in their in their organization, but they're counting Ken Griffey Jr. Even though you got end of career Ken Griffey Jr. You know, when they sign Manny Ramirez at the end and they're like, Manny Ramirez was a White Sox, was he? Like, that's what 2020 feels like in terms of like playoff berths. It's like we made the playoffs in 2020. Did it count really? Did it, was it really, when we look back at what happened the last couple of years, do we really sit there and say that was awesome? I like, I don't react to it the same way, but when you look at Aaron Bummer over the last two years, he is the quintessential find a relief pitcher when he's hot, ride him until he's not. And when it's over, it's over. I mean, he may all of a sudden get better later on in his career. He may have a couple of seasons here or there where he's very effective, But he's not the kind of guy who's going to come out, and there's very few relief pitchers who come out and put together seven years of just really good pitching. You got 2019 out of him. That was a good year for him. He had a a 3.41 FIP. He has an ERA plus in that season of a 216 over 58 games, an ERA of 213. His walks and hits per innings pitch, that wonderful whip, telling you how many guys actually get on base was under one per inning, .99. That's when he was really good. In the short in 2020, that whips 1.071. Amazing. It's everything you want from him. And then you get into 2021, and it goes up a little bit. It's still respectable, 1.26. The last two years, though, ugly. One and a half runners per inning. His hits per nine innings jumped. From, say, 5.7 in 2019 and 4.8 in 2020, and 6.7, it did go up in 2021. His hits per nine last year were 10.1. That's his hits per nine. His home runs per nine went up to an astounding .7. For a relief pitcher, that's bad. Like, he, he's not effective anymore. He's wild. And I I would imagine by this point, the book on him is, don't swing unless he gets ahead of you in the count. Like, if I were facing Aaron Bummer, just me, as the mediocre hitter that I am in my my lifetime, I would stand up there and take a few pitches and make sure he could find the zone consistently. Because I'm not going to get myself out against him. And I think a lot of people started doing that with him. And this year, by the way, 
going into last night when he takes the Dylan Cease poorly pitched game, yet another one from him, and Cease going out and loading the bases up. I mean, he doesn't even just let Cease's runs in. He gives up some of his own as well. It's a conga line, like an old Disney cartoon or Looney Tunes cartoon around the base paths. Eight runs in that inning, and he's a huge part of it. And going into it, he had a whip of 1.727. Option him. Nine hits per nine innings. Send him down. He's got an option. What do you hate Tanner Banks for? An effective pitcher in terms of keeping guys off base who can throw left-handed. Like, I, I keep I keep doubting myself. I keep thinking, you know what, Chris? You're the only person that doesn't realize that Tanner Banks' arm fell off last month, and that's why he's down there, right? Like, oh, you didn't know that Tanner Banks got run over by a herd of deer while he was walking in the woods? You didn't hear about that tragic uh, accident that Tanner Banks had? But every time I Google him and try to figure out if there's anything going on down there, I can't find anything except for the fact that he's pitching and pitching well. And he pitched well for us every stint that he's had in the last couple of years up here in the majors. You're hanging on the Aaron Bummer because you gave Aaron Bummer a long-term contract, and this is the front office always refusing to admit that maybe the guy with the longer years, maybe the guy with the bigger money, maybe the guy that you trusted in isn't the guy right now. You need to be a heartless general manager. You need to be a heartless person in the front office. And you you need to be able to look at a player and say, this guy's cooked, or at least he's cooked enough that he's got to work it out down in AAA. Hey, Sox in the Basement, guys. I used to think that the Sox problem was not enough left-handed hitting and creating balance. I think I'm wrong, and unfortunately, and hopefully I'm wrong with this, but I think there's a divide in this team, in the dugout, in the clubhouse, in the locker room, where you got the grinders versus the guaranteed contracts. Grinders in the corporate world are the guys that, you know, they plug along, they they work hard, and they put food on the table for their families. In baseball, these are the league minimum guys making about 700000 when a corporate person, a corporate grinder looks over and sees the guaranteed contract making 17 million, 9 million, 9 million, wearing a lot of bling and underperforming, that grinder gets pissed. He saw this going all the way back to the Ricky days, unfortunately, and Han thought Grafal could be the mediator between the two groups. Unfortunately, it hasn't worked yet. So in the meantime, we are basically watching the guaranteed contracts versus the grinders at guaranteed rate. By the way, the Royals came into Monday night averaging under four runs per game. They scored eight in the sixth inning. Three different Royal lefty batters drove in RBI hits off of Aaron Bummer, a lefty that's supposed to be shutting down lefty batters. And I felt like he was left in forever. Like maybe Pedro's pulling a page out of Ozzy Guillen's book. And he was kind of like, yeah, let's just kind of leave him out there and continue to prove to, to the guys above me that this isn't the guy I want my bullpen anymore. Socks in the Basement listeners, switch to a new age of life. Keep mom and dad, grandma and grandpa out of assisted living and make it so they can get around on their own and live independently. Nobody wants to move into assisted living. I, I don't think I've ever talked to anybody when they're discussing their retirement plans and said, you know what I eventually want to do? I want to go leave my home and live somewhere else with a bunch of strangers till I die. Like nobody wants to do that. You can keep them in the home with stair lifts, ramps, grab bars, lift chairs, bathroom remodeling, and, and Hyatt Home Medical Equipment is going to work with your insurance. They have 0% financing for qualified individuals and a discount if you mention socks in the basement. If you have a CPAP machine or need one, if you're unhappy with your vendor, switch and get supplies directly mailed to you, test it all out in their showroom. They also have the latest in continuous glucose monitors. Learn all about that and whatever else they can provide to you at hhme.com. Stop in and see them today, 3518 West 95th Street in Evergreen Park. I don't want to just talk about guys that are driving me nuts on this show, so let's talk about how Luis Roberts killing it these days because he has over the last week or so. Actually, I, I want to say last 15 days. I did a thing where I sorted out like White Sox stats and I did the last 15 days going in the last night. And Luis Robert Jr., 324 with a 479 on base percentage. Getting on base half the time, that's wonderful. Slugging 568, a 1047 OPS. And they need that because the only other guy that was really killing it as much as him 
when I go back and look at that time frame, was Aloy Jimenez, who gets the appendectomy and is now off four to six weeks. That's just brutal. Like, I, I call him glass all the time. I have a hard time calling him glass because he needed his appendix out. Like, what's he supposed to do? Let it burst inside of him and die? Like, I mean, like if he needs to have his appendix out, I don't know what else to say. Like, my dad had his appendix out. I don't call him soft. So, I mean, I think because he gets so many injuries, you're like, oh, another thing. And it stinks because you can't afford this kind of stuff anymore. You need to keep winning baseball games. You're in a hole. The season is not 280 games. It's 162. So, like, there's a point where you have to start winning more games than you're losing. Losing a guy like him, especially because he was hitting the ball well before he left, that, that's going to hurt you. But I, I like what I'm seeing from Luis Robert. I, I really do. I like what I'm seeing that Andrew Vaughn is getting the ball out of the ballpark. It felt like all he was going to do is just hit doubles just nonstop for the rest of the year, and you're going to sit there and say, what the heck? But you know what? He's doing better than Jose Abreu is right now. I love Jose. Jose's a great baseball player. He's having a rough time in Houston. We're going to see him this weekend. I really hope he doesn't put it together in his uh, in his home ballpark or the one that he grew up in, that he that he spent his entire Major League Baseball career. I'm sure the Astros are hoping that. I'm ho- I'm guessing they're they're figuring well if he can just get to Chicago and play where he used to play, he'll just go nuts, and, and he'll he'll have a great weekend and they'll get him on track. I guarantee that's what they're hoping for. I wonder if the Sox nerd has any insight into this. Joining me on the phone line right now, our good friend, the Sox nerd. You know Dave Marin. He comes on each and every week here at Sox in the Basement. He also puts up all the little tidbits and nuggets over at the rate up on the scoreboard. He's had a much better week this week, I imagine, than the week beforehand or the week before that because they finally started winning a few games. How are you, Sox nerd? Fantastic, sir. How are you? I'm good. I, I, you know, I, would, I just need him to string together 10 right now. They can string together 10, and I'm going to get invested in this team again. They're getting there, right? If they win series, then they will end up doing very well. If they could just they could just win four out of every six for like the next month or so, we're back in it. Beautiful. And the schedule is, I know people don't like to hear excuses, but the schedule is easing up a little bit, as they say. So As long as you slay the bums, everything will be <laughs> fine. What do you got for me this week? Well, Chris, returns have always been an interesting part of recent White Sox lore. When a Sox legend or fan favorite came back in a new uniform, he usually received a warm welcome. Back in the day, Nancy Faust would play Welcome Back as a walk-up song, and more recently, maybe the player would be greeted with a tribute video produced by the talented scoreboard staff. On the next homestand, one of the franchise's all-time greats will be returning, and I'm not talking about Cleveland Guardians first base coach, Sandy Alomar Jr. No, Jose Abreu will be playing his first game outside of Sox Yarns on the south side when the defending World Series champion Houston Astros arrive at the rate on Friday. I'm assuming and hopeful that Abreu will be greeted warmly by Sox faithful. In fact, I don't ever remember a returning player, with the possible exception of Chris Sale in 2017, getting roughed up by Sox fans the way, say, Albert Bell was in Cleveland in 1997. So who has fared well in his return to the south side? Frank Thomas probably had the most memorable reacquaintance with Sox fans. Looking really out of place in the green and gold of the Oakland A's, the big hurt homered off John Garland on the fourth pitch he saw as a visitor to then-named U.S. Cellular Field on May 22, 2006. Frank homered later in the game, but the Sox had the last laugh winning thanks to a walk-off bunt by Pablo Ozuna. Those were the only two homers Frank hit as a visitor to the park where he is the all-time leader with 263 bombs. Another intriguing return came on August 17, 1989. 19 days after being traded to Texas, Harold Baines collected three of the Rangers' four hits in a 6-1 to Sox win at the Old Park. The highlight of that return, though, came three days later when the Sox surprised Harold, and everyone else for that matter, by retiring his number three. The return of most other notables ranged from meh to bad to uncomfortable. Luis Aparicio was 0-3 for with a walk and a 7-0 Sox win on May 1, 1963 for Baltimore in his Chicago homecoming. You know, Ozzie Guillen's return was kind of sad. On April 29, 1998, Guillen, buried on the Baltimore bench, popped out as a pinch hitter to Greg Norton against Carlos Castillo for the second out in the ninth inning of a 16-7 Sox win. 
Ozzie's first game as a visitor to Chicago was his last as an Oriole. He was released two days later. Now, here's my zinger, Chris. Jason Benetti floated the possibility of the Sox using a position player to work the ninth of Sunday's blowout in Cincinnati. That got me to thinking, had the Sox ever used a position player in a game that they had won? The answer is yes, and it happened many times in the early part of the 20th century. The last time it happened was on October 6, 1907. Frank Isbell got the final out in a 4-2 win over Cleveland in the season finale in Chicago. And that is still the last time because Pedro Gafal elected to use Alexander Colome in the ninth on Sunday and not say, Panzer, the answer, Alberto. Sox nerd Dave Marin is brought to you by the law offices of Parente and Norum. If you've been injured at work, you need a team that will do what it takes to fight for your rights because insurance companies only care about one thing, their bottom line. They've got experience, dedication, proven results, and they have recovered nearly a half a billion dollars for their injured clients and loved ones. Free case evaluation, call or text today, 312-641-5926 or visit pninjurylaw.com. Dylan Cease is killing my fantasy baseball team. Just as much as he's killing the White Sox right now. And, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to it. I, I honestly don't. I, I know we need him. I know if we're going to go anywhere, we need these starting pitchers to really put it together. He was the guy I was least concerned about. Like, like at the beginning of the year, I would have told you Dylan Cease, not worried about him at all. I know there were concerns, and we actually read him uh, coming into the season in fantasy baseball that his strikeouts were down. But that was because in the second half of the season, he was pitching more to contact because he was trying to go later in games. And I look now, and he isn't striking a ton of guys out, and he's also not getting late in the games. So he's not getting any of the good results. He's only getting the bad results. I mean, take a look at his games going into Monday, which was atrocious. Monday was bad. We all all saw that. He gets opening day. He gets a 3-2 win. He pitches six and a third in Houston. Great start to the season. You're like, here we go. Dylan Cease picking up where he left off. Ten strikeouts. Gives up one earned run, only two hits. Doesn't walk a soul. He's got a magical whip at that point. Like one of those ones that just make me all tingly inside. And then he comes out in his next game against San Francisco. And he actually gets the decision because he didn't get the decision in the game against Houston. And he goes five innings. And I hate that because he didn't go six, but he still strikes out eight right? He still only gives up one earned run. He walks five though, which is a little bit concerning, but okay, fine. And then you just see this steady decline. The next game, it's five innings again, doesn't get anywhere near a quality start, still only gives up one earned run and then two unearned runs. You see the strikeouts drop again. I mean, we're saying 10 to eight to six over those first three games. And now we get this slide where, okay, uh, six innings pitched against Baltimore in a losing effort. He did not take the loss, but in a game where he gave up six hits over the six innings and walked five. So he was essentially just under two runners per inning in that game. And it shows with four runs crossing the plate, even though only two of them were earned. And then April 22nd in Tampa Bay, only four innings he goes. That's it. Gives up three runs and it gets worse when he's back at home against the Rays, when he gives up six earned run over four innings and only five innings against Minnesota the last time that he's out, where he gives up four runs over five. A quality start is three runs, three earned runs over six innings. And it's not something spectacular to get that. Like if you average three earned runs for every six innings, your ERA would be four and a half. It would be nothing to write home about. Nothing at all. But this is the line in the quality start stat just to try to indicate if the pitcher gave his team a chance. Did he get them through two-thirds of the game and keep them within striking distance by not giving up more than three runs during that? And again, if you always did that, you'd have a a four-and-a-half ERA. It's not dominating. I'm not asking him to be dominating. And I've asked this of the entire staff. I want to see quality starts. I want to see you get six innings, and I want to see you give up three runs or less. If you don't make it six innings, and you don't give up three runs or less, I am not clapping and saying great effort by that pitcher. I don't even care about the amount of strikeouts. If you're going four and a half innings, if you're going five innings, and you're striking out nearly 10, 
and you come walking off the mound, and now the bullpen's going to get taxed, and you lose anyway in the eighth or ninth inning because your bullpen's terrible. I mean, sure, okay, you started off well, but aren't you more of an opener? Like, go six. If you're a starting pitcher, go six. Minimum. Otherwise, I have a really hard time patting you on the back and saying you did a great job. Dylan Cease does not go six very often. He went six in his fourth game of the year on April 16th. He went six and a third on March 30th in his first game of the year. He's pitched in eight games at this point. Sox in the basement listeners, Hailstorm Brewing Company's Scratch Kitchen is now open 11 a.m. Tuesday through Sunday for lunch. Their smoked wings are so good, they've already appeared on Chicago's Best, and they have an incredible set of lunch specials at Hailstorm in Tinley Park. And here's what I love. They incorporate the beer into the menu. I mentioned those smoked chicken wings that are being featured. They have one with a Vlad barbecue sauce. That is their Russian Imperial. They turned it into a barbecue sauce. It's awesome. 8060, 186th Street, right off of 80th Avenue. An incredible lineup of beers. It is a working brewery with a full tap room and then a large German-style beer hall. Check out that menu. I want you to plan on getting lunch at Hailstorm. If you are in the Tinley area, I highly recommend you take a break and get over to Hailstorm, break up your workday, see everything they have to offer, the lineup of beers, and that menu at hailstormbrewing.com. I mentioned earlier that uh, my father was asking me what I wanted for my birthday, and I feel silly even telling him. I'll be honest with you. You know, being, being 46 years old and having three kids of your own, it seems weird to me to tell my dad, like, dad, I would love it if you bought me a pony. Like, I don't know. I don't know what to tell him. Right. And and what's funny is, is that he calls me up and discusses the gift with me. Like, I was like, I'm thinking about maybe maybe some scout seats. Like, I just kind of threw it out there. Right. I mean, you know, he likes to he likes to splurge. I know him. I know it's in his price range. And I was like, oh, maybe some scout seats. Me and you will go. I saw his eyes light up. He was like, that's a good idea. Get away from your mother for the day. Go out with you, you know? I think that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah, maybe I'll do that. And then he's on the phone with me the next day, and he's going over all the options with me, and he's discussing it a whole whole thing with me. It's like I already know what I'm getting. I'm getting scout seats. Like I gave him like four or five things I wanted to get, and then all he did was talk about scout seats the next time he was on the phone with me, and and options other than scout seats. Like he's like, you know, they got that one club level thing that like sits behind home plate, but it's a little bit higher up. They got a bar in there or something like that. I've never been in there either. Maybe we do that instead. Maybe we do the club seats. I don't know. I'm going to look into it. I'm going to call my ticket agent. Like he's like, he's all fired up about it. And and it, it begs the question. And I have this question for you listening, looking at this season and thinking to yourself, okay, I may not be as intently paying attention to each pitch, depending on if the White Sox can either, you know, Ed Farmer the season, right? A bloop, a blast, uh, a little dribble here. A couple of wins over there, maybe sweep a series, bing, bang, boom, you're back in it, right? If they can do that, then it'd be awesome. But if they don't, or while I'm waiting for them to do that, I'm looking for what enjoyable things that I can try around the ballpark that I've never done before or that I don't do enough. Because normally I go to a game, I sit there and I just concentrate on the game. But now I'm sitting there thinking to myself, all right, there's other experiences. There's stuff to do in there that maybe I don't pay as much attention to. So, like, we're looking at different sections we we may want to sit in. Maybe I'll go food hunting one day. I don't know. Uh, But if if you have something you do, hit me up. You can can leave a voice message right there on the website. Uh, You can fill out the contact form. You can drop into my DMs. You can tweet me directly, however you want to do it. Hit Ed up, too. Ed's not on the show today. They had some family things, and uh, I was kind of hoping that he'd be on the show, and then kind of last minute he was gone. So it's just me and you for this episode, but he'll be back at the end of the week. Hit him up as well. I'm going to ask him this question. like, where, What are you going to do if, if, if the game is not the most important thing? And look, I love baseball, and I am going to be watching the game. But if it's like, how do I add to my enjoyment in a season that's going the way it's going right now? You may have something you do at ball games that I don't normally do. And so I'm curious about it. So reach out and let me know. But speaking of dad, and we're part of a season ticket thing, and speaking about exploring the ballpark, my sister goes to the game recently and runs into a problem that I have been told multiple times was never going to happen again. They're not letting everybody onto the 100 level. Now, I've always thought this was a stupid rule. The idea that 
If you're in the 500 level, you can't come down to the 100 level. And enforcing it when you're going to have barely anybody at the ballpark this year, or at least you're going to have a lot more undersold games than you would have expected, unless things turn around. And, you know, there's been positive signs. I'm not just saying because they, you know, what happened in the Royals game on Monday, I'm giving up. I'm not giving up. All right. I, I, they could still do something. I'm just saying they have to put in every effort possible. They have to win every series, essentially. They have to take three out of four when it's a four game series. If it's a two game series, take them both. No splits, no series losses. That's how you get back into it. If you're really going to get back into it, if you're really going to capture my imagination, if you're really going to convince me that this isn't over yet, if you're going to convince yourselves of it, if you're going to mathematically do it, you have to take series. You have to take three out of four and not split. It's it, You got to beat the bums. You got to bum slay. When you play a team that's that's worse than you, who you claim is worse than you, you got to beat them up. Because if you don't do that, you're never getting back into the thing. But in, in this state, when we're not going to see these huge crowds, I don't expect big giant crowds on most nights. The idea that you still can't walk around the ballpark and explore it is just maddening to me. I feel like that the White Sox have always tried to find an excuse to take away fan experiences. It used to be in the bullpen, bar, and grill. You could just walk out and stand there and watch the game. There were no seats there. Just walk out and stand there. There weren't even restrictions on the amount of people that were out there. And slowly but surely, there was a limit to how many people could stand there. Then there were seats out there. Now they got those ridiculous councils that are down there with the best seat in the house thing that they do. And it just has become like one of those things where it's like they took away the fun of that area. And I've never understood why you, you get you get these idiots from Elsip that came running down onto the field years ago and attacked the, the, the coach from the Royals. And rather than respond with making sure that you just had proper security, maybe asking the question like, I don't know, did anybody notice these two drunks? I mean, they they, they kind of stood out when you saw their picture, right? Like, I would have seen those guys kind of walking down, getting near the field. I think I might have gone, I don't know. They, they don't look like they're up to, to any good at all. But the idea that you just react by not allowing anybody from the 500 level because they had tickets up there to ever come down to the 100 level because of that one incident, it's ludicrous. You know, it just continues to hurt your fan experience. And then during COVID... What they did is they restricted everybody to their individual levels, and they started telling people they had tickets that were more expensive, that were higher up on the tier level, like the 300 level, they could no longer walk down to the 100 level. And I know they got a ton of complaints off it. And we got told all off season, don't worry, those restrictions are going away. And what's funny is, it's still happening. Now, the reaction that I guess we got after we informed the White Sox of this this week, our season ticket holder group, was they actually want to know what ramp it was and what what time of the game. Like, they're really trying to find out who's still enforcing the rule. So maybe it's just a communication problem. But I'm going to tell you something right now. If you're not going to allow your fan base to see your whole ballpark in a season like this, if you're not going to entice them with you can have an experience or at least see an experience that maybe you would pay a little bit more for, well, we're sitting around struggling then I think you're missing a major opportunity. And I think, again, it, the, there's no logic when it comes to how they, they evaluate players and how they build their team. There's no logic to how they run their ballpark. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found. And always on SocksInTheBasement.com.